Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody this morning uh, for a very important conversation. Um, and a special welcome to those who are joining us online on Facebook Live. And I invite you to tweet your questions uh, for the audience Q&A portion of this using the hashtag Merkley at USIP. Um, so for those who don't know, USIP was founded by Congress in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan federal institution. And we are dedicated to resolving and um, preventing violent conflict around the world. And we do this by working with partners um, in troubled spots to equip them with the ways to, to uh, prevent and resolve violent conflict. And we also serve as a convening hub here in Washington, bringing together policymakers, researchers, and practitioners um, to have the kind of critical conversations that we'll be having this morning on, on the most pressing challenges that we face today. So today we have an important conversation uh, with Senator Jeff Merkley from the great state of Oregon. Uh, and Senator Merkley really defines uh, the, ha someone as having had a career as a public servant. And he started as an intern with the former Oregon Senator Mark Hatfield, who was one of the great champions of U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, and we are grateful to Senator Hatfield, to Senator Merkley, and to the many Oregonians um, who have been keen supporters of USIP through the years. Senator Merkley is a member of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on the State Foreign Ops and Related Programs. And he's the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Multilateral International Development and Multilateral Institutions. And in that role, he has worked very closely with the subcommittee chair, uh, Senator Todd Young, to elevate the kind of humanitarian issues we're, we will hear about today and to look at what are the underlying causes of crises around the world. So having spent much of my career working in these kinds of environments, and including 14 years with the international NGO Mercy Corps, I'm somewhat of an honorary Oregonian, uh, but I really want to express my gratitude to Senator Merkley for taking these issues on. Um, he recently returned from an epic trip, traveling to Somalia, South Sudan, Djibouti, Kenya, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's an extraordinary itinerary. And in those uh, visits, he looked at what are the underlying causes of these humanitarian crises and the looming famine. And in Africa, he held more than 35 meetings with local civil society, refugees living in camps, aid workers, government officials. And I want to just take a moment to give a special welcome to two youth leaders who are visiting with us here uh, from South Sudan at USIP, uh, Nia Changwath Rambakti uh, and uh, Nimisho Joy Bagi. So warm welcome to them. I want to commend Senator Merkley for his travel, really taking on those kinds of trips to war-torn countries and shining a light on these issues. Somalia and South Sudan in particular have been teetering on the edge of famine for the last several years. The Democratic Republic of Congo has been cycling through Congo, uh, conflict for the last 40 years. Um, and we see now more than ever that violent conflict is really driving these kinds of humanitarian crises. I am really struck by the fact that a decade ago when I was doing this work, 80% of our humanitarian aid went to victims of natural disaster. A decade later, that's flipped, and 80% goes to victims of violent conflict. This is a long-term commitment of the U.S. Institute of Peace on how to reduce violence, particularly in fragile states uh, where countries have weak or illegitimate governments. Congress plays a vital role in how America addresses these issues. And so voices like Senator Merkley's are absolutely critical. So we are honored to have him here today to share his views on these issues. Um, with that, please join me in welcoming Senator Merkley.
Well, it's a pleasure to join you all this morning and uh, certainly to be here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. The, when I first came to Washington, D.C., it was 1976, summer of 1976, as an intern for Senator Hatfield. And I had a chance that summer to read his various books he had, he had written and, and uh, become familiar with some of the projects that he cared about. And he cared tremendously about issues of conflict in the world and resolving them. He had been with the first group of Marines who had gone into Hiroshima in Japan after the nuclear bomb had been detonated. And he had seen the enormous, enormous uh, devastation that had occurred there. Uh, in so doing, uh, he worked incredibly hard to curb the role of nuclear weapons to advance the conversation about resolving conflict. And certainly um, a piece of that was his desire to establish an institution that would advance the cause of peace, an academy for peace, and that was the, the root of the creation here of this organization that has done so much, uh, so much good over these decades. And um, certainly I wanted to, to recognize that the, this is not just a building in which conversations occur, but also an organization that is supporting good work in different parts of, of, of the world, and particularly several programs in Africa regarding conflict resolution. So, so pleased that that is, that is the case. So it was a real desire of mine as a U.S. Senator to be able to join the Foreign Relations Committee, but I wasn't able to do that until this legislative cycle. And um, so I'm pleased I was able to, to, to do that and return to some of my core interests. When I was uh, considering what to do with my life, uh, I was uncertain. I had uh, skills in math and science that had taken me into the university, but I was curious and interested in the rest of the world and the human experience. And in that time that I was, was here as an intern for Senator Hatfield in 1976, I was struggling with this question of, of public policy and how, I understand how you could build something tangible like an engineer, but what about policy? Can you put yourself into a future in which you can affect the rules by which we guide our societies? And I, I proceeded to drop out of college the following year and stay here in D.C. and intern with a variety of, of groups and to uh, do so to, to ponder what I was going to study when I got back to college. I figured I was two years in and didn't know what I was doing. It was time to figure it out. And the, what I came to uh, conclude was that I would throw myself into third world economic development. And that's what I studied as an undergraduate and then I studied in graduate school I worked a summer with the State Department in India. I had lived as an exchange student in West Africa. I worked in villages in Mexico. And I thought that's the way I was going to pursue my life, um, was doing as much as I could regarding third world poverty and conflict. And then, just as I was getting out of graduate school, uh, I was interviewing for a variety of positions uh, with the fellowships, and I was offered a, um, a fellowship with the Secretary of Defense to work on strategic nuclear policy. Completely different world from third world economic development. But at that point, it was just uh, minutes uh, before midnight in terms of the doomsday clock for the, the uh, uh, atomic bulletin scientists. And I felt the biggest threat to the planet was at that point nuclear war. So I felt a moral obligation to step into this unexpected opportunity and, uh, and did so through the, through the 1980s. So that is a long journey back to being on Foreign Relations Committee and back in trying to be engaged in third world economic development uh, issues. Uh, in November of last year, I put together a congressional trip uh, to go to Burma uh, and Bangladesh to respond, uh, have the 
United States Congress respond uh, to the ethnic cleansing that was taking place in, in Burma. Uh, it was a situation where Aung San Suu Kyi had given a speech to the United Nations in September of last year and said, we have nothing to hide. We we'll invite the world to come and see what is, is going on in Burma, in Rakhine State, with the Rohingya. Uh, and uh, I took her up on that. And then the day before the trip, uh, our plans to visit the villages were, were canceled, as they were canceled for so many international organizations. We were still able to go to Rakhine State, uh, to, the, to go to the capital of Sitwe, to hold a lot of conversations, uh, to see the Muslim quarter, which was quite striking. And then we went to the, the refugee camps in, in Bangladesh. Well, that trip in November was one piece of responding to major challenges in the world. The trip in March to Africa was another. Uh, it's become very apparent that there's so much going on in the world, whether it's war in Syria, whether it's uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, that the issue of famine in Africa, the four famines, is just getting lost. Uh, and yet here were reports of uh, in the four famine regions of Yemen and North Nigeria and Somalia and South Sudan, some 20 million people at risk of starvation. So that's why uh, I embarked on, on, this, on, this, on this trip, was to understand better and draw some attention to it. I invited a lot of colleagues to, uh, to go as well and discovered that there wasn't a great appetite to go to difficult regions of the world. Uh, so, um, so I went alone uh, with my team member, uh, Laura Uptegrove, who is here. Feel free to, uh, and I may just have you stand and wave to people. Uh, feel free to follow up with her on issues involving foreign, foreign affairs. Um, and it's, it's Laura who, who developed the most intensive travel schedule for uh, a CODEL with every second occupied with meetings. And uh, as I was standing seeing the pictures here from Kachanga refugee camp in, in DRC, it brings back uh, a lot um, that's going on. And it's in DRC uh, that um, USIP has an initiative to support the prosecution of economic and environmental crimes, which is terrific. And in South Sudan, where USIP is working with the Sud Institute to train civic leaders. And so um, the places I was going are certainly being uh, touched by the work being done here in this, in this, in this building. Uh, basically, the, what we saw was the combination of the impact of conflict and corruption and climate chaos. And I use the term climate chaos as a little bit more vigorous description of what's going on in the world than simply climate, climate change. In South Sudan and DRC, we saw that the main driver for famine-like conditions were conflict and corruption. In Somalia, climate and conflict. In Kenya, the food insecurity driven by climate chaos. And that food insecurity is both a, a cause and a, a, a product of the conditions of, of conflict. In DRC, we saw a country that is abundant in minerals, natural resources. It's estimated to have the potential to be able to produce enough food to feed uh, two billion people. And yet, eight million an estimated 8 million individuals in DRC are food insecure. And I think about how DRC really has uh, had much difficulty uh, throughout its history, really going back to kind of the first colonial disruption, uh, King Leopold, and uh, all that went on uh, with Western interaction with DRC at this time. And, um, now, in just the Kasai region, conflict has displaced over one million people. And there are mass graves. There are mass graves with children, two UN investigators, including an American, Michael Sharp, were killed while investigating uh, the crimes committed 
in Kasai. But a couple stories that struck me um, uh, from the, this location. Uh, we flew up to Kachanga by helicopter because it's extremely difficult to get there by road. Uh, and also this refugee camp uh, had um, uh, a lot of security, uh, which I'll come back to later with kind of the, the number of, um, of uh, gangs or militias uh, that are moving through villages uh, in, in the area. But as I went, I went from uh, hut to hut in this refugee camp, and in one of them, and it was just a very kind of uh, uh, almost made out of woven, some type of uh, woven fibrous uh, stock. Um, and um, there was a, a fire inside, and so it was just absolutely a, a cloud of smoke inside. But out came a woman and had her young uh, son come out. Um, he was disabled, and he had a crease in his skull that went an inch and a half, two inches deep from a machete. Uh, a machete had just completely crushed uh, his head, and he was disabled uh, as, as a result of, of that. And kind of a um, reflection, uh, if, if you will, of um, the type of uh, conflict that was, was occurring. And um, in that area, uh, in that area, you have these uh, large number of militia. So many of them stem back to the uh, civil war that uh, took place in Rwanda. And uh, when the Tutsi came back, back down, many of the Hutu went over into the eastern part of the DRC and uh, remain. And if you have uh, some, some guns and some machetes, you can go from village to village and, and raid. Uh, and so some estimate there's 70 such groups, some 140 uh, such groups. But it's really complete chaos, producing a tremendous number of, of refugees. And there is a, um, a child soldier reintegration center in uh, Goma. Uh, that uh, where I spoke to some former child soldiers and particularly uh, one uh, young man, uh, 17 years old, who told me his story. And he was in a village in that region and uh, one night uh, one of these militias entered the village and uh, a couple soldiers from the militia, if we can call them that, a couple members, came in and uh, basically said uh, to uh, his uh, mother, uh, hand over uh, $2,000. Uh, and of course, they didn't have $2,000 uh, there in the village, and, and she was killed. Uh, then uh, the father, and the father found everything he could possibly find of value, handed over, and then he was killed. And this uh, young boy was um, uh, hiding in an adjacent room, and the soldiers came through and found him and were on the verge of killing him, so he was 14 at the time, when they said, no, no, he's old enough, bring him with us. And so uh, he went, because he, he was taken away with them, and uh, he proceeded uh, to try to escape the next week. Uh, he was caught, he was brought back, he said another, they showed him what they do uh, to those who try to escape. And while I didn't give details, my understanding was there were horrific consequences that he witnessed, and at that point, he did not try to escape after that. Uh, and for three years, he was a part of this, this uh, militia, going uh, village to village, compelled to be there under threat of his own life. And then he was assigned to go out to a uh, highway with uh, three other individuals uh, to try to can't, well, I say a highway, but some road of some sort, uh, to try to stop a car and steal from it. And two of them had guns, two of them didn't. He had a gun. The other person who had a gun was the person who had killed his parents. Uh, so he told me that um, he made the decision of what he was going to do. And he, he shot and killed the soldier that was with him, the team member was with him, who had killed his parents. 
He said he told the other two young boys, you can either come with me or not come with me, but I'm escaping. And there had been pamphlets uh, distributed in various places by the Blue Helmets in which he had been able to uh, observe how to find them. And he went and he found them and they got him to this, uh, to this camp. And I, I tell you this uh, story uh, because it's, it's just symbolic of the results of the chaos that comes from this type of, of conflict and a very, very difficult uh, challenge as to how to take it on. But thank goodness that we are funding, we in the United States are funding operations like this center uh, for, for uh, former child soldiers. So uh, uh, that conflict disrupts the ability to improve conditions uh, for millions of people. In South Sudan, another country rich in, in natural resources, you have yesterday the anniversary the anniversary of the, the seven years of, uh, as a new nation, but it's been over five years of uh, civil war between President Kiir's government forces and the supporters of uh, former Vice President Machar. Uh, the, uh, some peace talks have been held and held in, in places, uh, Ethiopia and Sudan, Uganda, uh, that, that there is not, um, there is not at this point good news uh, that there's some resolution of this uh, situation. And more than six million in South Sudan face severe life-threatening hunger. Over four million have fled their homes. This makes South Sudan the world's third largest source of refugees behind only Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, there, there in uh, Juba, um, I went to the Guri Nutrition Center and um, met with three women. And these three women are standing there uh, with their babies in their arms. And one woman proceeded, all, of course, all through the translator, to describe that her child had HIV. And the second woman described how her child had malaria. And the third uh, described how her child was being affected by malnutrition. And I just thought, here we have uh, HIV and malaria, two of the, the great scourges of, of, of the world, and malnutrition. Uh, and why were they there? They were there because their husbands had been drawn into the conflict between the president's forces and the former vice president's forces. And the result of that conflict is their husbands had disappeared. They didn't know if they were alive or dead. And without the support of their husbands, they had to flee to be able to have any possibility of nutrition. Also think about the chaos in um, uh, South Sudan from going to Kakuma refugee camp in, in uh, Kenya. Uh, where many of the refugees are coming out of, out of South Sudan. And um, I met a, a woman who um, had with her 13 children. And uh, she told me her story. And her children were not just her children, but they were the children of her and her fellow wives of her husband. And her husband had disappeared <laughs> Uh, not to um, return, and so when she decided that she had to flee with her, her children, uh, the other wives said, take our children as well and try to save our children. So she fled with her children and children of the two other wives of her husband uh, and made it, made it to this refugee camp. And they had not yet been assigned a, a place to um, a kind of a, a, a place to reside. Uh, they were in the, still in the processing of figuring this out, and so she had no idea what what awaits her and and her family. But just the fact that they were there together, uh, she also said that that she was at great risk because the her husband's brother. Uh, felt that by her leaving with the children, it was unacceptable and was trying, was trying to kill her. 
uh, and bring the children back. And uh, so the complexity of, of the situation of war and, and famine. At this refugee camp, uh, the, um, they were measuring the biceps of, of children uh, with a, a tape that basically had different colors on it. And if, uh, the, if, if, if the bicep of, was tiny, uh, so tiny that when they put the tape around it, it was in the red zone, it was basically a way to say severe malnutrition. And it was in this room with these, these uh, uh, mothers holding their children, and it was one child after another. And all I could see is every time they measured a, a bicep, it was the red zone. In other words, child after child with severe malnutrition. They were getting a, a plumpy nut, uh, which is another uh, a product being provided to help provide uh, enrichment, uh, food enrichment, recovery. Uh, but uh, certainly a reflection of the, the challenge. Uh, the um, UN Commission of Inquiry has chronicled some of the massacres and violence committed by President Kerr's forces, and I heard a lot of stories about that. And there in South Sudan, also used by child soldiers. And the report identified more than 40 senior military officials who have carried out war crimes against humanity. Let's turn to Somalia and conflict in, in Somalia. Met with um, President Formaggio, uh, who came actually to the State Department uh, uh, enclave, um, because the State Department is not allowed to go out of the conclave. Uh, and it's actually uh, something that they wanted me to send the message back here to our State Department, to our leaders, to say, let us out of the enclave. The State Department representatives of every other country are allowed out of the enclave. The Americans are not um, because of our assessment of the, of, of the risk. But they said they couldn't really do their jobs. I was astounded that the president was willing to come to the, to the enclave uh, to, to meet with me. Uh, but um, al-Shabaab is, a, is a, a real challenge in that, in that country, the conflict there. Uh, and one of the things that um, uh, came up um, that the, I just, well, this, the president is new there, and um, he was very engaged in policy discussions in a way that I did not encounter in many other uh, countries, uh, and uh, including um, talking about uh, the impact of the charcoal trade and how charcoal was a source of funding to al Shabaab. So not only was the country being deforested because of people needing to cook their food, but al-Shabaab was making charcoal to export, and that export was helping to fund the, the terrorist operations. Uh, the um, uh, challenge there was that in the last 30 years, they've lost 80% of their trees, uh, which actually I'm probably getting my head of myself into the climate. Uh, impact here, but um, it is tied in, as all three of these pieces are tied in between conflict and corruption uh, and, um, and, and conflict. Uh, in DRC in South Sudan, I met with UN peacekeeping missions, two of the largest in, in the world. I saw really the key role that they're playing. In Somalia, I met with uh, AMISOM, the African uh, mission for Somalia. Uh, the African Union peacekeeping forces are helping and working to help the government in Somalia gain territory, regain territory, maintain control over civilian, country civilian centers. And it's critical that the United States continue to, to work with these peacekeeping uh, efforts. Turning to uh, uh, corruption, uh, the 2017 Transparency International list of the most corrupt nations uh, has um, put South Sudan uh, as second only behind Somalia. So in two of those countries that I was at, certainly a, a huge uh, impact. One member of the South Sudanese parliament has described the nation as lacking any and all regulations to combat frauds and malfeasance among government officials. 
Uh, in South Sudan, half the population faces severe life-threatening hunger, more than a million children acutely malnourished. There, when I visited the World Food Program Packaging Center, they were bagging and rebagging and rebagging food. And why were they putting food inside one bag, inside another bag, and inside another bag? It was because they were going to drop the bags out of a plane to provide food around the country. And why were they going to do this? They were going to do it because first, the checkpoints uh, from both the government forces and the opposition forces are basically a series of obstacles for delivering, delivering food. Um, and I found it uh, just a, a source of um, uh, fr deep frustration that the, the, the government forces indeed are, are not well enough controlled that they are also involved in these checks points, these points of extortion. And so here is the country that they govern in desperate need of international help, and yet they're turning that help also into a, a source of corruption. So to be able to deliver the food, they're dropping it out of uh, planes and, and uh, I mean, partly the condition of the roads, but also very significantly the, these checkpoints. And you have uh, uh, the challenge of corruption in uh, DRC. Um, many describe this uh, as a, a country where uh, elections are and governance in any sort of democratic form is, is long gone. There was supposed to be an election in 2016. It was postponed to 2017. 2017 was postponed and uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley went over and said, we, this needs to happen. And so there was a commitment to do it in December of 2018 of this year. And when we were there in, in March, uh, the major point of effort uh, was to prepare for these elections, for the U.S. to try to really encourage. And so the, the, um, the acting uh, charge, Jennifer Haskell, who happens to come from a little town in southern Oregon, Roseburg, where I was as a little child. So you had two Roseburg kids over there in uh, DRC. Uh, she wanted us to hold a series of meetings related to the elections and really encourage them to be held. And one of the issues was how they were going to do the voting in remote parts of the country. And the election commissioner was determined that this was going to be done through an electronic voting machine. And the story we kept hearing is these machines were being purchased from South Korea at many multiples of what their normal price was, kind of just a piece of the uh, corruption. And then the second is that using an electronic machine in remote villages makes no sense at all. Uh, how's it going to respond to the humidity, to being exposed to the rain? And individuals would be coming to that machine who have no idea, have never touched an electronic device before. And then uh, in the, I held a, a meeting with a group of advocates, some of who had participated in a, in a demonstration of the machine, and they had had difficulty using it. And they were urban, college-educated individuals. So what sense does it make to be running these voting machines um, uh, out through all these, these villages? But, uh, the election commissioner was determined that this is the way it was going to, uh, to, to happen. Uh, another concern was the credibility of the voting rolls. And so that was um, uh, uh, something that was significant uh, amount of conversation about. And uh, the Conference of Catholic Bishops had volunteered with their extensive network to really be involved in, in this effort and their offer had not yet been, been taken up, but hopefully uh, will be. So um, I don't know if the elections will occur this December, but if they do, I think they're going to, there's going to be a lot of issues with it. And, and uh, when I, I had a dinner with civil society leaders, um, they, they were not convinced that even if elections were held, that Kabila would, would, uh, would step down or there'd be a transfer. 
And you think about how these different issues interrelate, and uh, we, 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 we hope for one symbolic advance, like, like a free and fair election, but that could be just a moment in time in a long course of trying to find a path uh, forward to a, a, better, a better place. Let me turn to climate. Uh, so uh, this is an issue that is perhaps the most significant planetary issue to confront our generation. In my lifetime, the amount of carbon pollution in the air has gone up by almost 100 points. Within a year or two, it'll be 100 points. What I'm, so here's what I'm talking about. When I was born, there were, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere was about 314 parts per million and now it's almost 414 parts. During the 200,000 years of kind of human presence, uh, the points have varied just a few points in the course of any generation. Uh, completely different situation now. The curve is accelerating upwards. At the time I was born, carbon pollution was going up a third of a point per year. Now it's going up two and a half points per year. Um, in the last 10 years, while I've been in the U.S. Senate, we have seen half the coral reefs around the world be, die or be deeply damaged. In my state, we see warmer winters that are great for pine beetles and terrible for pine trees. We see forests that are drier and with more summer lightning strikes, and so we have forest fire season that is much longer and more devastating. We have a billion baby oysters that died in 2007, 2008, because the Pacific Ocean is 30% more acidic than it was before we started burning fossil fuels. Uh, so those, we have to artificially buffer the water for baby oysters to survive now in, in Oregon and off the coast of, of Washington. You see the impact certainly as an additional, deeply aggravating factor in, in, in Africa and in these countries we were visiting. And what has the US done? It's bailed out of the, the Paris Agreement, formally not till 2020, but effectively abandoned its world leadership on this incredible uh, challenge of uh, climate chaos, carbon pollution, and our support for the Green Climate Fund, uh, which I've worked intensely to try to get additional money to, and was successful after the Republicans took the Senate, but while President Obama was still in office, we were successful, uh, and, but, uh, but not now. Uh, not now, the combination of the control of the Congress and the control of the, the presidency. So our pledge to assist other countries, including countries of Africa, in terms of responding to the challenges of climate is um, uh, uh, unfortunately being unfulfilled. When I was in Somalia and speaking with President Fromajo, and he was, we were talking about the impacts of climate, and he was also saying, and don't forget about the impacts of the microclimate changes. And he said, because of all that, that deforestation, the precipitation and moisture that comes from those trees that no longer exist, putting off moisture and then uh, feeding additional rainfall in other parts of the country was also disappearing. I hadn't actually heard anyone talk about that type of microclimate effect except regarding uh, the Amazon in, and Brazil. But the fact that he was concerned about that and thinking about that, I thought was a, a strong point. It's one thing to have one failed season because of drought. It's another to have year after year after year because it, there's no longer any seed stock. And if you plant it and the next year dies and the next year dies, you're basically uh, in the position of having to abandon agriculture and, and flee somewhere somehow, adding to uh, the challenge, the challenge of conflict and the challenge of, of hunger. Um, and I mentioned one thing that he raised was a driving force behind the acceleration of the deforestation was Al-Shabaab selling charcoal internationally as a form of, of raising uh, money. So uh, this isn't just a problem for Somalia. In Kenya and the Horn of Africa they have grown hotter and drier. Recent research says the region dried faster in the 20th century than any time over the last several uh, thousand years. In Kenya, there was uh, a lot of conversation about a Chinese 
a coal plant, a, a plant to burn coal and produce electricity. Now this is a country that has very little electricity produced from fossil fuels currently. And in fact, it is aiming at having 85% of its electricity come from renewable resources by the year 2020, two years from now. And it's had enormous uh, potential for geothermal with the Great Rift Valley where the continents are separating and you have a lot of hot, hot rock uh, just below the, the surface. It makes no sense in the world for Kenya to be building a coal plant. And it makes no, it no sense because they don't have the coal, for one. They do have some low-grade coal reserves far away, but no transportation system to get them there. Uh, but shouldn't the U.S. be doing everything possible to help with renewable uh, energy uh, rather than supporting the creation of a coal plant? And I say supporting because even though it's a Chinese plant, U.S. companies are involved in some of the transactions and there's uh, various varieties of support for the, the sale of uh, parts from those, those U.S. Uh, companies. Uh, the, um, and let me just say, you know, China back home they're engaging in tremendous amount of renewable energy. They're determined to put out more renewable energy by 3030 than all the electricity generated in the United States of, of America. But they are also at work on over 100 coal plants around the planet. This is where, again, American leadership is needed to call this out and change that direction. So while we need to have folks on the ground working on renewable energy with individual nations, we also have to have the leadership uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world to, to take uh, this on. Well, all of the involvement we, we have there um, uh, in regard to these challenges, it's, in, it's important because uh, human life is at stake. It's an issue of moral uh, leadership. Uh, it's also a matter of national security because uh, hunger and the impacts of uh, climate chaos certainly uh, drive um, uh, instability and the growth of uh, extremist groups. Uh, there's also national security issues that we have in the context of uh, the role of other major nations and their influence in the region. And there's certainly the economic side. So let me just mention a few things that, that I'd like to see. One is for the State Department and the executive branch of the United States uh, to be really intense about having our leaders on the ground. At the time that we were there in March, the U.S. did not have an ambassador in Somalia. We did not have an ambassador in South Sudan. We did not have an ambassador in DRC. We did not have an assistant secretary for Africa. We should have. We should have those important positions filled. We now do have an ambassador in South Sudan. We do have a nominee for the DRC. Uh, we do not have a nominee yet for Somalia. And we do have an assistant secretary for Africa. Not only important that we fill these positions, but they're filled with very capable experts and utilize the expertise that our, our foreign service where people have dedicated decades to developing the knowledge and ability to address the issues in different parts of, of the world. Second, we need to maintain robust foreign aid funding. Uh, the administration has proposed a 30% cut to our foreign affairs budget. Um, let's not do that. And so far there has been Democratic and Republican support for maintaining uh, the, the, the funding. Uh, let's make sure this U.S. Institute of Peace keeps, keeps funded uh, because it was, I think it was zeroed out in the president's budget, I believe, last year. Last year. Uh, not this year. Good, uh, because we held a lot of conversations about that a, a year ago. Uh, in one of the things I saw in um, uh, DRC in Goma was a Heal Africa Health Center, uh, where it was a phenomenal center responding to violence against women. In that refugee camp that I was in in Kachanga, the, um, uh, we we heard about how the daily trips out of the refugee camp to collect wood were enormously perilous for, for women because they were so vulnerable to being attacked, to being raped, 
on, on those trips. And that type of chaos, there is a tremendous amount of uh, violence against women going on. And this center that the U.S. was, was funding, this Heal Africa uh, Center, was a phenomenal uh, center of assistance to, to women who had suffered abuse. And also, it was our funding that was involved in that Child Soldier Reintegration Center. We should be doing more of this, not less. Or the Guri Nutrition Center in South Sudan, that, where the, the children's biceps were being measured and U.S. food was mattering. When I was here in Kachanga, and you saw on one of those other pictures uh, the bags of food and oil, I said, how often does this sort of distribution occur? And they said, once a month. And uh, I don't think it was a coincidence it was happening on the day that Laura and I happened to be visiting. And then I said, well, did it happen last month? And they said, well, no, because we didn't have enough supplies. I said, did it happen in January? They said, no, it didn't happen in January either. So I said, you know, once a month was the goal, but, but they don't have en enough supplies. Uh, that's an issue of how much funding we're able to, to put into our, our uh, support of the World Food Program. So it, it really comes down to mattering. And so I decided we should send a member of the U.S. Senate there every month so that there would be a distribution every single month. <laughs> Met with uh, organizations that were working with renewable uh, energy, including uh, microgrids like BBOX. Um, uh, and again, there's, there's a, a group that's uh, doing good work, but a little assistance from the United States can, can, can really uh, help. We should then think seriously about things that affect corruption. I was very, very disappointed when the Senate used the Congressional Review Act to undo uh, the resource extraction rule that said companies have to reveal the payments that they're making for resource extraction. Uh, that sort of transparency that was part of Dodd-Frank, that's very important to being able to take on corruption. Now, the way the Congressional Review Act works is it can be raised as an issue, gets 10 hours of debate, and if one side yields back their time because they want to shorten, then it's five hours of debate. So it can be raised at 5 p.m. in the evening, debated for five hours, voted on, and reversed, done like that, with no chance for anyone to know that it's, it's happening uh, or to be able to weigh in on something that has a significant impact, in this case, an impact on corruption around the world. So um, we need to fight for transparency and support transparency, not the opposite. We need to support Power Africa effort, and, but make sure that we're supporting renewable energy because unfortunately some of the projects are in fact fossil fuel uh, projects. We need to support the Millennium Challenge Corporation. I had seen on an earlier trip uh, to Africa enormous impact um, uh, the, uh, in which a, a country was really doing everything it could to meet the required standards for transparency and several other required standards in order to make sure it would qualify for a second round of Millennium uh, Challenge. Uh, and we need to lead by a example and recognize that the last thing we should be doing is rejecting those at our borders who are coming, fleeing persecution, to submit a claim for asylum. And I was just out at that border on the, at Hidalgo and um, watched as our border guides blocked every family who was trying to assert asylum. They let through people with visas and passports but couldn't get one step across the center of the Hidalgo Bridge uh, and that's the example we're giving to the world right now. When I came off that bridge and went into the, the um, port of entry through the doors, I asked if anyone was there who was asserting asylum. They said, yes, there is a family here. I said, can I speak to that family? So a woman came out with a baby in her arms and uh, she told me about her plight in Honduras where her family had a loan they couldn't repay. The private bank is how she described it, had a relationship with the drug cartel that ran the neighborhood as an enforcer. And uh, the family was told that she would be killed uh, if, um, 
if they didn't repay the loan. And she thought she was safe until she delivered her baby. So with eight months pregnant, she fled, delivered her baby en route, going through Guatemala and Mexico to the United States, got to the bridge in Hidalgo, and was turned back time and time again from stepping onto U.S. territory at the official port of entry. And so I said to her, how did you get across and in through these doors? And for a moment, her entire face lit up. And she said, ah, she says, as I was rebuffed time and time and time again, she said, I noticed that on the car bridge, where there's multiple lanes of cars, that there were people out there washing windows and for tips. She said, so I went and I asked if I could borrow a squeegee. And I washed windows, starting on the Mexican side of the bridge, until I had crossed over into the American side, gotten clear across the bridge. And then she was on American territory, asserted her asylum claim, and got in the door. But here's the kicker. Under the change in the definition of asylum that our Attorney General put forward just a few days ago, she will not qualify because she is the victim not of an official government, but of an unofficial government, a drug cartel that runs her neighborhood, a so-called gang under the Jeff Session uh, rules. She had her little girl in her arms. She said her little girl was Sacinta Cinco Diaz, 65 days old, Andrea. And we need, as we work with the issues across the world regarding refugees, regarding climate, we need to set an example. We need to be a leader on climate, but we also need to honor the Refugee Convention and proceed to give people a fair chance to assert their asylum claims here in the United States of America. Yes. The, um, um, coming back to Senator Hatfield's involvement in uh, establishment of this, he also uh, planted a tree on the Capitol grounds in 1985. And uh, as he, wa he was doing this because he loved trees and uh, he wanted to set in, he thought trees are a contributor to a healthy world. Uh, so uh, he planted this tree. This tree is an interesting story in and of itself because it's a tree that's been extinct in North America for millions of years. But if small grove was found in China and he had heard about this and he arranged for this tree to be planted and as he was planting it, he invited uh, Senator uh, Kennedy to come out and join him. And the two of them planted the tree together and Senator Kennedy said, our work on the nuclear freeze movement, this should be known as the peace tree. And I've been spreading the word that the peace tree, which is just a few feet short of being the tallest tree on the Capitol grounds, that when it becomes the tallest tree on the Capitol grounds, we'll have a new era of peace in the world, a new support for taking on conflict, new support for taking on climate change, and may that happen very soon. Thank you. Nancy, do we have time for a uh, little bit of dialogue? Okay. 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 Senator Merkley, thank you for that compassionate, thorough, deeply based in understanding the complexities of the situation overview. Um, it's important to have people like you go visit those kinds of places. You just took us through a landscape filled with complexity, chaos, conflict. I, I want to just ask a, one quick question, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience before you have to run off. Bright spots. Did you walk away with a sense of hope from any of these travels? Well, one bright spot uh, was um, the, the new president of Somalia, mm -hmm. uh, who um, uh, is a, also a U.S. citizen. Uh, and uh, just as he was speaking about the, the policies and, and the, the challenges, he was clearly immersed in, in the issues uh, in a way I've seen with very few leaders. And who knows uh, where, what we, how we'll evaluate his leadership um, a year or two down the road, mm -hmm. but, but certainly that was very, very refreshing. He had a certain uh, earnestness and determination about him. Another was really the renewable energy picture in Kenya, where Kenya is uh, uh, close to being completely uh, free of fossil fuels, so it can fend off that coal plant in, 
and, and continue to invest in both geothermal and, and solar. Uh, and um, I, I think also just when I met with, uh, in DRC, with the uh, citizen advocacy groups, many of them putting their own lives at risk, uh, but how many of them there were, how determined they were, how organized they were at, at, at wanting to uh, strive, dedicate all their efforts to a, a better, different future for the country, a country uh, or a future in which all of that, those incredible minerals could be harvested for, uh, to have a very significantly affluent uh, nation rather than one with the vast majority suffering in great poverty. We're going to open it up and take a couple of questions. Um, we've got a mic here. Is there, you want to, right in the middle row there, Ellie? Gentleman in the blue shirt. And then is there anyone else? We'll take just a couple. Uh, right down here. Thank you for this opportunity, Senator. Uh, first of all, you have to note your speech was preceded by piano music. Beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Very peaceful. A hypothesis that a person I respect has about global warming and who, who, who may end up fighting it, because the corporations, whether it's Google or Exxon, have pe experts who know the climate change is real. It's to their benefit if they get out ahead of it, producing better solar energy. I'm going to ask you to be short, sir. Oh, OK. So if you have any idea, this is even a possibility. And while you have the microphone, the, a possibility that companies like Google would advocate to take on climate? Even Exxon. Even Exxon, yes. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, the, uh, a number of the, the major energy companies, oil, oil companies, are advocating for a, a carbon fee. Uh, because they feel something's going to happen, and they'd rather have the kind of the orderly, uh, knowing kind of what what it is that's there, rather than a, a series of conflicting, chaotic policies. Uh, I'm not sure, really, though, how much that is um, public relations, and how much of that is sincere. And uh, in the uh, Sheldon Whitehouse is um, uh, making the point that a whole number of companies that have adopted kind of very progressive sounding climate positions are funding trade associations that are doing everything possible to stop renewable energy. So um, uh, that's, that's a, a point that we should recognize that if a company's really sincere, it can't just simply put in their public materials, we're doing X, Y, and Z, and we're buying more renewable energy. It also has to, to, to say we're not going to be part of a trade association that is sabotaging those very efforts. Uh, and we'll do, we'll do two quick ones. This one and then someone over here, right here. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Rochelle and I'm from the Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies. Thank you, Senator Merkley, for being here. I wanted to ask, uh, in light of, in recent times, we've seen a lot of threats to healthcare. Uh, in a lot of these disordered settings or in settings of conflict, whether by explicit attacks and violence on healthcare systems or by crum crumbling infrastructure that's threatening the ability for healthcare systems to reach people. So I'm wondering in your visit to these five countries if you got any sense of that or if you heard any stories or experiences about that. And before you answer that, let's just take one over here and we'll do both at once. Um, I'm Samantha Tafoya from Search for Common Ground. And I wanted to ask a question about the reintegration programming you spoke about in the DRC, and if that is more of a countering violent extremism or developing interest in, um, I guess, on the American part, and if you see possibility for that sort of support elsewhere in the Horn. So health centers and a reintegration center. Um, uh, the health centers, I uh, visited a, a several uh, I can't really compare them in time to what happened before. Uh, there are cases where um, uh, militias have raided the health centers for the, they want the supplies because they have their own set of, um, well, injuries from the, the conflict, so on and so forth. So they don't, they, they aren't, they, um, that can, they aren't a sanctuary that can count on being set a, free and apart from the, the conflict uh, aggression it's itself. Of course, it's very hard to get um, healthcare workers to go in and um, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners who, uh, to be there in sufficient numbers for, to meet the need in, in many of these locations. And often the supply of, of medicines is uh, significantly short. Um, so it's, 
No, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but I can't really judge better or worse. I will say that the effort to take on uh, the um, great, uh, let's see, what's the right word, the great uh, diseases of the world, but malaria and AIDS and tuberculosis and uh, have, have resulted in uh, significant strengthening of the healthcare architecture in some parts uh, of the world, but um, okay, I exhausted what I know on this, which wasn't much. <laughs> um, the, um, I, I arranged to do a drop by of one health center and it had a list, I had a sign outside that had maybe 15 organizations that were contributing to making that health care center work, including the United States. Um, so let's, let's keep up our part of, of, of that deal, uh, but um, much more, much more could be, could be done. Uh, the Center on, on Child Integration, if I understood your, your question, was it simply about taking care of, of uh, some of the kids and giving them a shot, or was it about reducing violence? Was that in general? Was that the question? Oh, well, so, but you also represent the Child Integration Center, the, okay. Well, so that center was solely dedicated to those young men and giving them a shot at catching up on education, uh, kind of um, decompressing from the enormous uh, world, uh, intensity of the world they had lived in, where they were essentially compelled to be part of raiding villages, shooting, killing people, rape, escaping from all of that and developing a, a different future for themselves. The young man that I met with, uh, I asked him, what, what do you want to uh, do now? And he said, I want to be a mechanic. Uh, and we followed up uh, with the, our delegation there, our leadership say, are there mechanics programs that we can help tie into <laughs> that, uh, to that program? Because obviously unemployment is high to begin with, so it's, it's, you're, it's so much of a hurdle to just recover from what you've been in, to escape it, but then to catch up on education and to be able to find a trade in a, in a, in a world where there's a lot of folks who haven't gone through the same dire circumstances who also aren't finding jobs. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's really... Uh, difficult. Um, more broadly, um, I inquired about how do you put a stop, how do you try to stop what's going on? And the answer was incredibly hard. Uh, the blue helmets um, don't try to follow the militias through the jungle. They're like, they know the jungle better than we do. We can go in into villages and say, you can strengthen your ability to, re to reduce your vulnerability to them. Uh, and if you're attacked, let us let us know, uh, here are our resources, but they really can't go in and compete in the middle of the, the, the jungle. And so it's pretty much what, you know, to use a phrase from America, the Wild West, uh, absent of, of, of rules and controls. And, and none of the people we talked to had any clear, effective strategy that they thought could put an end to it, except to make the villages themselves somewhat more resistant. But you have a village and then you have a group of militias sweeping in with, with guns and machetes, it's pretty hard to fend that, fend that off. So, and then economic development, yes, I mean, we're involved in, in many economic development projects, but they're, they're modest and they're scattered and they're here and there and they're all good and we should do more, but they're not, it's not massive. Senator, I wanna just give one last question before you have to run away to our youth leader from South Sudan. Uh, my name is Nya Shankwath. I'm a current South Sudan youth leader here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I work with an organization called Assistant Mission for Africa in South Sudan. Uh, Senator Makley, <coughs> my question is, what do you think is the obstacle to implement to the intervention of the U.S. and the international community in making sure that the peace being implemented in South Sudan. Thank so the, you. The barrier to 
to finding a peace accord? That, that may be a bigger question than you can can't tackle in a minute, but the important. So I, I know that there are <laughs> experts in this room who probably know a lot of the details of the negotiations that have been taking place in the various uh, cities. Um, one, and, and I'm not one of those experts. Um, I, as I understand it, one of the challenges is the, um, the former vice president, who is the nominal leader, uh, is, it doesn't have all the connections with the uh, opposing forces because he's been out of the country in South Africa and the opposition has split into many pieces, maybe into several militias. Uh, so there isn't a firm uh, uh, ability to control what, ha what happens. Uh, you also have folks uh, on both sides, the government side and the resistance side, uh, that, that are profiting significantly from the current state of chaos, including extracting money out of international organizations delivering food. Uh, so um, uh, as long as those in charge are benefiting and the friends right around them are benefiting from the chaos, that's a real problem because they may not have the determination to end the chaos. And, and so uh, that's just a scratch the surface response. And I wish we could spend an hour to have those who, who have a lot of knowledge and experience contribute to answering your question. But it's my hope that here, uh, the day after the anniversary um, of uh, South Sudan's founding, that when we get to the 10th anniversary, three years from now, that we'll be at a, a different point where the civil conflict will have been resolved. Uh, the international organizations will be free to provide assistance, which will mean more economic development. Maybe there'll be really much stronger uh, foundation for the, the building of civil institutions that can uh, carry the country forward. That would be a wonderful hope for a few year, years down the road for, for South Sudan. I'm so glad you're able to, to be here. Senator Merkley, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for caring about these issues and being a voice in the Senate for these issues. Um, we will invite you back three years from now to headline an event of celebration. Okay. And please join me in thanking Senator thank Merkley. You.